Ocean Calls. Hello and welcome to Ocean Calls, the Euronews podcast for Friends of the Sea. I'm your host, Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes. In previous episodes, we spoke about the importance of marine protected areas, shark conservation, and which kind of salmon to buy at the supermarket. And today, as our minds wander and begin dreaming of our summer holidays, we decided to dive into an ocean issue that's quietly overwhelming some of our favourite seascapes. Lounging on a beach towel, listening to the waves and enjoying the waters of the legendary Mediterranean Sea. Many of us have been there. In fact, the Med is the most popular tourist destination in the world, as well as being home to millions of people. But the Med is getting heat stroke. From May to August last year, nearly the entire surface of the Mediterranean was hit by a marine heat wave, and the warmer water is punishing natural ecosystems. So why are the heat waves happening? What's the impact on corals and fish? And can we do anything about it? To discuss marine heat waves, I'm joined by two experts in the field. Joaquim Garabao, Senior Researcher from the Spanish National Research Council. Hello, Joaquim. Hello. Hello, Jeremy. And Emma Sebrián, a researcher at the Centre of Advanced Studies of Blanes in Spain. Hello, Emma. Hello. Nice to meet you. And at the end of the episode, renowned Swiss explorer and innovator Bertrand Picard, the first man to fly around the world in a solar-powered aircraft, tells us a moving tale of his family's ocean exploits. It's great to speak about these type of memories. <laughs> OK, Emma, Joachim, now you're both working in Catalonia. Um, can we, kind of as non-specialists, can we see the impacts of marine heat waves? I go to Catalonia on holiday quite often. W- would would a, a normal person be able to see the impacts of these heat waves in that area? Well... I would say that the people that knows the sea, they can see it, the impacts. So the people that has been coming to the Catalan coast for the last 20, 30 years, they can see the changes because they are visible. But the normal people, most of the people, even the people that live in uh, in Catalonia and go every summer to the beaches, they don't realize what is going on. The dramatic things that we are witnessing now. The only thing that they see is that, uh, okay, it's hotter, it's warmer, but they don't know what is happening under the surface. I agree with Kim. It's not um, easy to see snorkeling because not all habitats have suffered similarly. So those that are deeper, sometimes you can see some mortalities. And also you don't need to be an expert to see dead gorgonians or dead corals due to the climate change. There are changes already in the Catalan coast that you can see only just putting your mask and your snorkel, like uh, the arrival of some thermophilic species. So these species that likes uh, warmer waters or the the proliferation of uh, different species like uh, the jellyfish blooms, for instance, it's something that has been also related to the, the warming trend that is happening now in the Mediterranean. So can you just kind of paint us a, a broad picture of, of the problem of these heat waves that we're seeing, is it similar to the kind of heat wave that we might experience on land? Kind of what's happening? Yeah, I mean, sometimes they are linked. So when we see a heat wave in the air, we have as well a marine heat wave in the seas. And uh, the marine heat waves are linked to the warming trend that we are already experiencing in, in the Mediterranean. And what is a marine heat wave? A marine heat wave is like in air. It's a period of time where the, the temperatures are extremely hot or extremely high for a period of time that it can be some days, even weeks, and they can uh, have temperatures above four, five, up to six or seven degrees higher than the, the normal temperature for that period of year, according to the climatic uh, means that we have for the areas. 
Emma, do these heat waves move around the Mediterranean in the same way that a, a weather moves around the Mediterranean? That's to say relatively quickly, actually, or are they more slow moving? No, they move as the weather is moving. Many times the marine heat waves are quite related with the environmental condition you have in the atmosphere. So the thing that's literally kind of warming up the water is the hot atmosphere above it. There's no other kind of source of heat. It's exactly. not that there's nothing else exactly. going on. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so just as we're suffering from repeated heat waves now, and we had the hottest summer on record last year in, in Europe, and the one before that was the hottest on record, is the same thing basically happening in the Mediterranean, in the water? Yeah, it's the, it's the same. And the problem is that the, this frequency, especially in the Mediterranean, it's becoming uh, more frequent each year. So in the last five years, I think we had the more extreme marine heat wave we've got during the last uh, 20 years. Uh, Joachim, can you give us a, a bit of context, really? Because it sounds like a recent phenomenon, then. This is something that's just started, is it? Yeah, I mean, what we have to mention here is that uh, we started to have uh, records from sea surface temperature from satellites uh, back to 40 years ago. So this is the main source of information about uh, the describing or quantifying these marine heat waves. And what we have been looking at, the, at this uh, sea surface uh, satellite data, what we see really clearly is this uh, increase in the frequency, in the extent, and in the intensity of uh, the marine heat waves in the entire Mediterranean. It's true that not every year you see the entire Mediterranean heat by a marine heat wave during the last 10 years, but now for the last 10 years, every year we have marine heat waves uh, on setting in, in different areas of the Mediterranean. And the last summer, for instance, the Western Mediterranean was the most affected region of the Mediterranean by the marine heat waves, while the Eastern Mediterranean was not affected by marine heat waves. But maybe next year is going to be on the other way around. The problem here is this repetition. And what it was once some sporadic and not frequent event, now it's uh, the new normality. And how deep do the heat waves go into the ocean? Is it just really the first couple of metres or so? Is it going deep down? Oh, no, it can go deeper. We have seen marine heat wave or extreme temperatures till 50 metres, 60 metres. Did you know that in the last couple of decades, marine heat waves have caused damage in marine ecosystems across the globe? It impacts species like corals, seagrasses and kelp, as well as triggering mass mortality events. Over the period from May to August 2022, all waters of the Western Mediterranean region were exposed to at least one marine heat wave. Can you give me some examples of some of the extremes that we've seen? You've talked about a few degrees ab above average. What are we talking about and, and where? Are there particular areas of the Mediterranean where it's practically a warm bath these days? I mean, if you want some examples, for instance, in the Catalan coast, in terms of temperature records, this summer, the last summer, the 2022 uh, summer in the Catalan coast, so we reached more than 27 degrees Celsius when never happened. It was the first time that uh, we witnessed uh, such temperature. In the Balearic Islands, uh, in some areas, uh, they reached 31 degrees Celsius. In the French coast, uh, this summer as well, we reached uh, 30 degrees in some areas, in the Côte d'Azur, for instance. Last summer, we broke all the records that we had with the time series that we have of temperature. So this concerns the surface water. But if you go and look at the, the temperature series that we have in deeper water, there as well, we broke all the temperature maximum uh, records uh, that we had. So it's really scary, in fact, uh, to see all those temperatures because all the habitats and the organisms that develop it in these areas, they are not used to. They are not uh, adapted to those. They and literally can't live in that hot water. It, no, they... they this is why we are witnessing these uh, mass mortality events on so many species affected, which it could be already something dramatic to see. But it's uh, not only a group of species, it's different groups of species, different such as fishes to sponges 
to uh, to corals, algae. to algae. Um, Emma, can you just talk us through what's actually happening then to some of those species that uh, Joaquin was, was mentioning? When the water gets very warm, what actually happens to them? Well, it depends on the species, but it, in fact, what it's uh, common in most of them is that they, they get uh, physiological stress. And when you get a physiological stress, then you are vulnerable to different illness, pathogens, or the reproduction is affected. So this summer, you spend all your energy in surviving, and then you don't reproduce at all. I'm thinking about some of the stories I've made about heat waves on land and the effects on humans. And they always say, I suppose, that the people who are most vulnerable are the young, the elderly, and those who are working outdoors. Is the kind of equivalent the same in the, the marine environment? Yes. What we have seen that, for example, adults can resist some of these uh, stress um, periods, but the fitness is never the same. But I'm guessing that... Again, thinking of humans, what do we do if it gets too hot? We move into the shade, we try and adapt in some way. What can fish do? Can, can they do anything, actually, to deal with uh, this heat? So in oceans, for example, they move northward. And with fishes, it had seen, and also with macroalgae, for example, occurrence. The problem we have in the Mediterranean, that it is a close sea. They can't move north. They cannot move north, for example. So what if they just go deeper? Can they not just go deeper? They can go deeper. And in the Mediterranean, the movement is east to west because the warmer areas are eastern part and then they can move to the west. What does a heat-stressed fish look like? Can you, do you kind of see a change in their behaviour? Can you see anything from the outside by looking at them? Well, they, they, they can die. Even if they can move and look for... Uh, thermal refuge and deeper waters, if they go deep, they can go there, but they don't find what to eat, for instance. So they have problems as well. Yeah. Then they, they die. So, Or they suffer from some diseases, as has, uh, Emma was mentioning, that there are, if you are under stress, then you are more susceptible to, uh, to suffer some uh, illness. And we have uh, some records in the Mediterranean of, of um, for instance, the groupers suffering these uh, viruses, uh, diseases that uh, kill many of them. Yeah. For the other species that live attached to the substrate that they cannot move, they are really long-lived species that they can live tens, even hundreds of years. They evolved in this way, and now they are dying by thousands. So this is your corals uh, and gorgonians, those kinds of things. That, that, yeah. That's what's yeah. dying out. But then I guess the fish suffer because they're not able to feed and reproduce. That's, that's uh, where they're dying out, is it? Yeah, man. because uh, if we make the analogy with the forest, the rest of the forest, it's like we are losing all the trees. So the species that live hiding or uh, hunting because they can hide in the trees... They cannot find these places, and then you have less prey, and then there's a kind of a cascading effect on, on the functioning of the system. Let's talk about invasive species, because as far as I've understood, um, the heat waves have kind of been encouraging them, not that they came because of the heat waves, but that they came possibly for other reasons, through the Suez Canal, for example, but they've been taking advantage of the fact that the water is warmer. Yeah, yeah. this is the point. The invasive species arrive because of the humans. But uh, the problem that Mediterranean has a characteristic to have like a highway for the invasive, that is the Suez Channel. And all those species that arrive from the Red Sea has a warm affinity. So these warmer conditions you find in the Mediterranean before they were stick in the eastern part, mm. that was the warmest one in the Mediterranean. But if the Mediterranean is warming, the range of these invasive species will increase. So can, can you just talk us through some of the examples of the invasive species that are becoming more problematic or that are taking advantage of these heat waves? In my opinion, one of the most problematic species we have now in the Mediterranean are the ciganos. It's a grazer. It's a grazer fish. And where it has a great activity, so where they are in a quite abundance, they change completely the, the seascape. Then you find a desert instead of having a forest. This and is what they call a, a rabbit fish? Yes, this is the rabbit fish. And it's incredible the impact they have. 
you don't need to be an expert. You put a mask and you don't see anything. It changes. It's like the moon. And now it's in Turkey, Greece, or Israel. But this species will increase the distribution while the environmental conditions will be optimal for them. So they're eating everybody else's food? Yeah. In fact, for example, the native species, it disappears because it cannot outcompete with the invasive one. The problem is not the impact on the competitor. The problem is that they impact overall ecosystem. What happens? What's the logical conclusion of that? I mean, that can't carry on forever. The logical conclusion, I would say, uh, we have to do something with the introduction of it through the Suez Channel. And I think that everybody knows that for many years, scientists have advised it about that, and nothing is done on the contrary. And the Suez Channel each time is bigger with higher traffic. But can we do anything against that particular fish? I mean, can we try and fish them? Can we eat them, for example? Uh, in the areas where it's very abundant, it's fished. And each time the fisheries of this uh, species are increasing. And by the moment, it has not been sufficient to stop its spread and its impact. Is there anything we can do about that? Not by the moment. We are studying which are the different things that can control them. Usually it's impossible to control a terrestrial invasive species. Imagine in the sea. Yeah. So we have to act before. Joachim, uh, what we are witnessing, uh, Jeremy, is uh, a complete uh, change in the in the habitats, in the the degradation of these uh, habitats. We used to go and dive and see really wonderful and beautiful landscapes, and now our passion to go to the sea is still there. But uh, sometimes it's sad uh, to, to see what is going on and all the, the changes that we are witnessing, the magnitude of the changes that we are witnessing. Did you know that the water in the ocean is separated into layers? It's called ocean stratification. There are lots of reasons for this layering. It's linked to salinity, temperature and the weather. Climate change means the layers are mixing less than before. Let's talk about solutions, if there are any. Is there anything we can do, Joachim, at all? Well, I mean, all the, these international agreements that, uh, for instance, about the, the Paris Agreement on, on the climate issues, I mean, the international, the scientific community has already said, and it's every year, every, every time to time, the last... Uh, IPCC uh, climate uh, report telling that we still have some windows of action to stop the current warming. But what we really need is to take action and start doing things and realize that we live in a finite planet and it's not possible to keep growing like uh, if the planet uh, is not finite. For me, the main heat waves is an example. 20 years or 25 years ago, when we had the first a marine heat wave in the Mediterranean in 1999 that was associated with those mass mortality events that we are now witnessing almost every year. It was a kind of a episodic event, that an unprecedented event. And we make the hypothesis that this could happen in the context of the climate change. And now it's the new normality is having these events. This is not uh, possible to sustain is, for it, the ecosystems. Is there anything we can do and it, maybe this sounds silly or ridiculous, but is there anything we can do to actually cool down the ocean on localised areas maybe, in areas where we know it's particularly sensitive? Is there anything you can actually physically do? No. It will, it will waste a lot of energy on that. Imagine. There has been some proposals of uh, cooling down some areas with putting kind of uh, fans under the water to make the colder water from deep layers to the to the surface but this at the ecological scale it makes no sense i mean uh, we will be wasting our, our resources it would be just as ridiculous as i think to imagine some kind of pump that's going to move the cold water up no no i think also you will be moving cold uh, currents and all that so probably the impact you will have will be worse or unexpected at what you want one of the things that you can think also to do locally, 
that it has to go with other global measures, but is to have as best preserved as possible all the ecosystem we have. It's not the solution because they can be affected, but we have seen that for some impacts, if they are in a good conservation status, sometimes they can resist better. Well, this completely aligned with the recent agreement of the Biological Diversity Convention, right? So that protect 30% of the ocean and land by 2030. Yeah. And the rationale behind this is precisely this. Let's have uh, nature in the best conditions to be able to resist and to recover from the impacts that is going to happen. But as, I mean, as, yeah. as far as everybody is telling me, and when you read the IPCC report that you were talking about, we're just going to continue with our path of warming. We're going to get more and more of these heat waves. We're going to get parts of the Mediterranean Sea that turn into kind of desert, aren't we? But, or, and are there areas that are already basically lost because of these heat waves? Yeah. Yeah, I have a nine years son, and I'm I'm sad because one of the habitats I like it most to dive that it's a coralliginous habitat that it can be only found in the Mediterranean Sea. I think he will never see, as I've seen, he won't have the chance. What would you so, like to see? What would you like to see in terms of action from the European Union to deal with heat waves better? Uh, whatever are the different actions that we have to do to reduce the, the cause of the climate change and the cause of the, the, the demanding heat waves, which is the concentration, the increase of the concentration of uh, greenhouse gases. We have to work for this. And from our side, or at least from our side, mm. we can have the agreement of protection, protecting uh, 30% of the sea, but the current figures for the Mediterranean is that we only have 8% of the Mediterranean protected in some way. This is the first thing. So we have a lot of uh, work to do ahead to reach this 30%. The second thing is that in the European Union has the agreement of this 30%, 10% has to be strictly protected. And actually the figure of a strictly protected uh, surface in the Mediterranean is less than 0.1% of the protected area. So mm. here we have still many work uh, to do. What can we do as tourists? Because a lot of people listening to this like to visit those places we're talking about in the eastern and western Mediterranean. It's a lovely place, let's be honest. What can we do? Is there any action that we can take? Think about travelling. Think about how you get there. So you cycle there. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we have to think, uh, as I say before, it's, uh, we, we have to think in, in our way of living. And starting by how we are spending our uh, holidays, for instance. Now there is a debate of, you know, banning or not uh, these bikes that go over the, uh, the water. I don't the remember. Jet the, skis. the jet skis. I mean, I understand that there are people that like uh, jet skis, but in the context that we are now, it's really necessary to go and visit a, a marine protected area with a jet ski. For me, it's a, clearly a contradiction there. So think about your individual actions when you're on holiday somewhere about limiting the pollution that you might have in a, a local context. Yeah. If that's what you're talking about. Yes, as always, not only in holidays, but in holidays also, we have to be as most respectful with all the environment as we can. Final question, which is one which I, I think I might know the answer to this one anyway. Joachim, do you have any optimism for the future related to the health of the Mediterranean and uh, the future prospects of marine heat waves? To be honest, uh, I have to say, no, I'm not optimistic at all. The only thing that I say to bring some optimism to, to me is uh, that the international context and the agreements and the identification of the solutions are there, but we need to implement them in terms of uh, the climate uh, agreements, in terms of uh, biodiversity agreements, and the last agreement about the high seas, for instance, all these instruments that are already available to us, we have to speed up in the implementation. And if we make it, it's not going to be the solution for tomorrow. It's not going to be super optimistic, but the hope at least, we will be not uh, losing the hope. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I, I'm, we have to be ready to understand the Mediterranean as partly different, not uh, as it was like 20 years ago. And the only thing that um, gives me some hope also is that in the last year, I see the society more aware. And it's the first step. It doesn't mean that um, we will do something in a short time, but it's the first step. It's to be conscious that something is changing. And because if not, it's very difficult to ask the people to, to do something, to act. If the, you realize that something is happening and if you understand that you have a role there, maybe it's the first step to try to start changing something. Hopefully this podcast will contribute to some of that process of building awareness. Joachim Garabo and Emma Sebrian, thanks very much for joining us on Ocean Calls. Thank you to you. Thank you to you for this opportunity. And now, the part of the podcast when a famous person tells us all about their favourite ocean experience. Our guest is Swiss explorer and environmental advocate Bertrand Picard. You may know that Bertrand comes from a long line of record breakers, from his grandfather Auguste to his father Jacques, who set the world record for the deepest ever man dive in 1960. Let's hear Bertrand Picard's favourite ocean story. My name is Bertrand Picard. I'm a psychiatrist, an explorer, president of the Solar Impulse Foundation. So after having flown around the world in the solar powered airplane, I'm now looking for solutions to protect the environment. When I hear about ocean, well, the first story that comes in my mind, of course, is the dive of my father to the deepest spot in the ocean, in the Marina Trench in 1960. He had built this Batis Cave, deep sea submarine, with my grandfather. And uh, together with Don Walsh, an American Navy lieutenant, he made this dive to the absolute bottom of the ocean. First time that somebody saw what happened 11 kilometers down, seven miles down. To his surprise, there was a fish, a couple of shrimps, and that was so important because in those days, the governments wanted to drop the radioactive waste to the bottom of the oceans, thinking the trenches were desert and it would disturb nothing and nobody. But seeing a fish down there, it showed that there was oxygen. Oxygen can only come from the surface where the phytoplankton is producing it. So it obviously meant that there were vertical currents from the surface down to the bottom, and that if you throw something toxical down there, it would be completely mixed with the water and pollute the entire ocean. So when he came back, it was a big relief for all the scientific world. And for me as a child, he was telling me, you know, scientific exploration, this is not to beat a record. This is to make a better quality of life. It should be for the common benefit of everybody. In the late 1950s, all the navies of the world could dive a couple of hundred meters. And uh, my grandfather and my father together with a little group of engineers built a machine that could go seven miles down, 11,000 meters down. And uh, that was so impressive in those days that just Private people could achieve something like that. I asked my father if he was afraid during this dive, and he told me the only fear I had was the fear that something would go wrong before we would touch the bottom and we would have to abort the dive and go back up. That was his only fear. He really wanted to, to touch the bottom, to see if there was life down there. He had lived 10 years for that with my grandfather together building this Batis cave. It really gave me the wish to become an explorer myself. But difficult to be an explorer when you are a teenager in the early 70s. One small step for man. There was somebody on the moon, somebody on the uh, top of the Everest, somebody in the deepest spot on earth in the Marina Trench. What else can you do? 
I think I got this spirit of exploration in my education. And each time there was something new I could do, I did it. And then I crossed the Atlantic in a balloon. Then I thought, okay, the Atlantic is nice, but we can go all the way around. And I organized and flew the, the mission Breitling Orbiter, first balloon to fly nonstop around the world. And that brought to Solar Impulse to do it again, but not with four tons of liquid propane, but to do it with no fuel at all, just the sun as the only source of energy and flying on a solar powered airplane above oceans and thinking, well, my father, my grandfather were exploring underneath the ocean. I'm flying above it. That were fantastic moments. You know, when I crossed the second part of the Pacific from Hawaii to San Francisco, then across the entire Atlantic from New York to Europe, that were incredible moments. And I was flying, flying, flying with no noise no fuel, no pollution. And here I felt I was in the same, in the same direction that my father and my grandfather, trying to use technological solutions to protect the environment and to improve quality of life on Earth. Our thanks to Bertrand Picard for that story. Have a look at solarimpulse.com to read about his 1,000 profitable solutions to protect the planet. Ocean Calls is produced by Euronews for ocean fans around the world, and I'm your host, science reporter Jeremy Wilkes, and this series is produced by my colleagues Nara Davlashian and Natalia Olsner. The theme music is by Gabriel Dalmasso. Editing and sound design is by Jean-Christophe Marco, and mixing is by Mathieu Duchesne. Our production coordinator is Carolyn Lab, and our editor-in-chief is Sophie Claudet. The Ocean Calls podcast is made possible by the European Commission's Directorate General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. You can find out more about our guests by following the links in the description. And you can listen to Ocean Calls on Apple, Spotify, CastBox, or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Find out more on Euronews.com and watch our sister TV show called Ocean on Euronews.com slash Ocean. It's fabulous viewing. And follow world news from a European perspective on Euronews.com.